this is like of the whole month, this is the service. This is the one that uh, those of us who are in the planning meetings and the preaching team that we are so excited about. Week one, we talked about how God has chosen us and he's chosen us for spiritual adoption. He already made us, but he chose us to become a part of his family. So the people on your left and right, that's your brothers and your sisters. That's us. This is what you get right here, okay? This is, this is, this is who we are. Thanks. Somebody clapped. They like the family. Awesome. That's great. Those of you online, we are part of your family, and we're excited that you're with us today as well. Last week, Pastor Sarah, she talked about how uh, we were chosen for significance, that God has created us to, uh, to have uh, significance. And we weren't just created to just be here, but he created us with value and significance. Um, today, you are in for a treat, and you're in for an amazing opportunity. Our theme verse this month comes from Ephesians. It's Ephesians 2.10. You can see it up on the Sky Bible here. Here's how it reads. Your Bible says this, for we are God's masterpiece. Tell somebody you're, you're a masterpiece. Oh, you're, you're a masterpiece uh, is how someone may, might say it. You're, you're, uh, you're God's, you're his workmanship, you're his handiwork, his craftsmanship is, is on you. When he, when he created you, he's like, ah, voila, a masterpiece right there. But he didn't just leave us at a spot to just simply exist. It go, the verse goes on, it says, uh, we are created anew in Christ Jesus. So when we've accepted Christ, we're new. Everything's fresh and made new. And there's a reason for that. That's so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. When he created you as that masterpiece and he began to write the book of your life, he wrote your name down, he said, this is what I want them to do. This is their personality. These are their gifts. These are their talents. This is, these are their experiences that I want to use for my glory. So you were chosen by God to be a part of his family to do significant things for the kingdom. Today, we are talking 100% about putting this verse into action as we begin a partnership with an organization called World Vision. This is us continuing our quest to be not just a region impacting church, but a church that reaches people here, near, and far. And of course, we do that because we want to lift people through the power of the cross. And Pastor Sarah and I were introduced to this whole idea of chosen through World Vision. It was kind of a no-brainer for us. We both have worked with World Vision in the past as a youth pastor. We consistently did what is called the 30-hour famine, where we went without food for 30 hours, talked about world hunger, poverty, uh, lack of health care, uh, lack of good, good water. And Pastor Sarah, she partnered with them as well when she was a missionary in India. World Vision finds the community's greatest needs, and they figure out the best plans to meet those needs. And our speaker today is a gentleman named Steve Spear. And uh, he's got quite a, a fun story he's going to share with us here in just a moment. But I'm going to give a little bit of a, a little bit away. Steve ran across America, okay, like from Los Angeles to New York in 150 days. Like a, Damon, like a marathon a day. And Terry, if you're in here, like a marathon a day for 150 days. He didn't just do that because he thought it'd be fun, neat idea. Um, put some, you know, put some miles on. He actually felt God call him to do something very specific, and that was to raise money for uh, areas of the world that don't have clean drinking water. And in his efforts, he raised over half a million dollars doing that. That's remarkable, folks. <laughs> Amen. In this, in 2017, Steve was recognized on the floor of the U.S. Congress for his humanitarian work. And as a role model for all Americans, First Assembly, would you give a warm First Assembly welcome to our friend today, Steve Spear. Well, uh, thank you so very much. It truly is a pleasure. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, those of you that are here, uh, those of you that are online as well, uh, it really is uh, quite significant. And I'm going to tell you in just a moment why it's significant to be hanging out with you in Fort Wayne today. But it's really been uh, pretty fantastic getting to know Pastor Rob over the last little stretch of time. First time we met each other on a Zoom call, I'm going like, 
we're like related. Like we kind of look at, well, he's much younger and better looking than I am. But we're like, we often, I often think we had the same glasses. Then we saw each other this, today. They're not quite the same, but they're pretty darn close. So it really has been uh, wonderful. And then to be a part of the chosen series that you're in right now and uh, taking in last week's talk and then the week before from both uh, Pastor Rob and Pastor Sarah, you all, and I know you know this, you have amazing preaching here. I mean, give it up for your pastors uh, in their preaching. I'm serious. Man, I walked away from week one, and I'm like being, just being reminded that before the foundation, you know, we are cho- in, in Christ, we are chosen. And hearing that, and then just be revisiting that thought that that significance comes not necessarily through the success that we gain in the world, but the fact that we are chosen, that we are His. But being reminded of those things, those things simply amazing. So to be a part of this series now with you, uh, I'm uh, very, very grateful uh, to do that. I also want to bring you greetings uh, from the World Vision family. And some of you may be well aware, as Pastor Rob, about World Vision. Some of you may not be as aware of who we are at World Vision. But our mission is to follow Jesus. That's our mission, to follow Jesus by serving the poor and the oppressed. And we've been doing this for over 70 years, serving the most vulnerable, and we're in 100 different countries. But today, I wanted to give you an inside scoop. We're sort of like uh, pulling the curtain back a little bit. An inside scoop of something pretty amazing happening at World Vision these days. You see, there's a renewing spirit that's sweeping through us. And the Lord is using that to birth some new ideas. And there's a new idea that we want to share with you here and online in just about uh, maybe 15, 18 minutes if you're watching your clock. So when someone hears that I ran across the United States, they're usually wanting to hear some statistics. Uh, So before I give you those, let me show you an image. Uh, This is how the U.S. run began and how it ended. On the left... Uh, This was April 8th, 2013. So it was eight years ago that the U.S. run happened. That's at the very far west rail of the Santa Monica Pier in Santa Monica, California. And when I began the run, I wasn't quite sure how I would start. And when I got to that far west rail and looked over the Pacific, I I was like gripped with like insane fear. (laughs) Like insane fear, thinking what was behind me. And then I just, I like instinctively fell to my knees. I just said, Lord... Uh, I'm yours. Uh, This whole thing, whatever it is to become, it's yours. My family is yours. This mission is yours. And that's how the run began, on my knees. Uh, Not necessarily as planned. On the right, is that's when the run ended. It was a a marathon a day for 150 days in a row. Uh, That's overlooking the Statue of Liberty at Battery Park. That moment, friends, on my knees, that one got planned. Several states out. I began planning. I said, Lord, if you would will that this would run would end, I just want to bow in reverence. And I stayed on my knees so long because I just thank God for his provisions, for his providence, for his protection over me, our family, and all that occurred through this U.S. run. Now, what happened between point A and point B was this. I ran 3,081 miles. Not that I was counting. Um, I was. I ran through 14 states. I went through 10 pair of ASIC running shoes. Consumed 5,000 calories a day on average. We figured I ate about 1,000 in peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. God bless PB&J. God bless PB&J. Mid-run. That was just mid-run eating. High sustained elevation was 7,500 feet in Arizona. The greatest aggregate elevation change was in the Allegheny Mountains uh, in Pennsylvania. If you've ever driven through the Alleghenies, you'll appreciate this. One week of running was 175 miles with 32,000 feet of aggregate elevation change. Good for hill work. (laughs) Scariest moment, attacked by six wild dogs in Oklahoma. And then, as Pastor Rob mentioned, the most satisfying was that over a half million dollars uh, was raised for clean drinking water for some of the most vulnerable kids uh, in Africa. So very, very grateful for that. Now, what makes it significant is that I ran through Fort Wayne, which was a lot of fun. So uh, on the, from L.A. to uh, Chicago, U.S. 66 was the main route that I ran. But coming out of Chicago, it was kind of like Route 30, Lincoln Highway, for a better part, getting on my way to, uh, to New York. So I ran through Fort Wayne, which was pretty fun. A few days before Fort Wayne was day 116 of the run when I ran from Hannah to Etna Green. All right, The next day, day 117, was Etna Green to Columbia City. 
There's the dairy, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts. There's a Marathon gas station. Anybody know where the Marathon gas station is on 30 with the Dunkin' Donuts attached? You know, you guys see that. That ended a day run. Uh, it was a 12, the, the last 12 miles of that day was in a downpouring rain. And we uh, ended that day at that Dunkin' Donuts. I was never so glad for a cup of coffee in all my life. It was really amazing. And then uh, the next day, day 118, August 3rd, was when I went from Columbia City through Fort Wayne and ended on the east side of Fort Wayne. But I came in on Lincoln Highway down Leesburg, uh, Leesburg Road. Then I went east on State Boulevard, uh, followed the river south, and then east on Washington over uh, 469, then south on Berthloud. Anybody heard of Berthloud Road? Berthloud Road, thank you very much. Nobody in the first service knew that one. Those of you online, maybe you know it. But first, Berthloud Road, Country Road, and then went east on Lincoln Highway East, and a little jut of Lincoln Highway East, and ended five miles from the Ohio border, like in the country. So that was uh, day 118. But I tell you, it's just fun being in Fort Wayne because you all appreciate geography here in Fort Wayne because it's like your town. So uh, it's super cool. And then... We, uh, our RV stayed at Cherubusco, uh, and there's a place in Cherubusco called Brevin's. I don't know if you ever ate at Brevin's. We had the most fantastic meal at Brevin's. I, it made it into my journal, which, you know, Lord willing, goes into the book one day. So anyway, uh, I, but I got to tell you, those of you that are here and for those of you in line, I got to let you know I am the most unlikely person on the planet to run across the United States. I didn't run my first marathon, my first anything until 2007. It was the Chicago Marathon with World Vision. And I was a complete non-runner. As a matter of fact, I had four goals for my first marathon. Goal number one was to hate running less every time I ran. I hate running. Goal number two was to train well enough to make it to the starting line. The third goal was to finish before they closed the course. Uh, these were not high goals, you all. And then the final goal was to raise $1,000 for clean water. And I, I thought it would be a complete one and out deal. But God used that to reverse something in my life. He used it to reverse something in my life. A couple years later, I was invited to go and run the 56-mile Comrades Ultramarathon in South Africa. Now, I didn't much like running 26 miles. So the idea of running 56 was just pure craziness to me. Pure craziness. But yet, once again, I felt like God was inviting me beyond my fears, beyond my comfort zone. You've had that happen, right, where you're sensing him moving in a way beyond those kinds of things. Six months after that race, it was in November of 2010, I was at my in-law's home in Ohio, and I went out for a six-mile run, an innocent six-mile run. At mile three of that run, I felt and sensed a whisper from the Holy Spirit. It wasn't anything audible, but it was very defined. And it said this, Steve, you're to run across the United States for the good of others. Now, I thought that was like a bad burrito from the night before or something. I mean, that was just a ridiculous, ridiculous thought. So crazy, I didn't even tell my wife about it for two months because I was scared. I was completely freaked out by it because you know what happens? Sometimes if you say something out loud, you're like, hey, I don't want anything to do with that. So I like kept it in. And then, I don't know if you've ever done this. You've probably done it over the course of the summer. When you try to keep a beach ball under the surface of the water, you push it down and it pops back up again. You push it down, it pops back up again. That's exactly what I did with this whole vision for the next 12 months. And finally, after like 12 months of that, you know, spiritual gymnastics routine, I just felt the Lord, you know, calming something in my spirit. And I finally just put my arms up in surrender. And I said, God, I don't get all of this. Uh, I do know that you're calling me to devote myself more to running and how running changes lives. And if the expression of that is they run from L.A. to New York, with more unknowns than I can count, I, I, don't, I don't get it, but I'm in. So my wife and I did what all sane people do. I resigned my pastoral position. I was pastoring uh, with a church in the Chicago area, an uh, uh, influential church in the Chicago area for 16 years. I resigned my position. My wife sold and liquidated. She had a 3,000-square-foot brick-and-mortar antique shop that she'd been building for six years. We sold it and liquidated all the stuff out of it. We like, went for broke on the whole deal. And the driving question is Why? Why would we do this? Why would we arguably do the hardest thing that we'd ever done? Why would I do arguably the hardest thing that I'd ever done physically, emotionally, spiritually? Why? You see, because God was reversing, beginning and carrying on this idea of reversing a false narrative in my life. The false narrative is this, that people who have less are less. That's the false narrative. That people who have less are less. And God would use a run from L.A. to New York to reverse that narrative that people who have less 
are less. But what we are called to do, followers of Christ, and you've been learning this, is from that key verse from Ephesians chapter 2, we are called to be his workmanship. We are called to be forces for good in the world that we live in. We're called to do this because we're his. And that we're called specifically to affirm the inerrant dignity of people and to restore the broken circumstances in our world. That's what we're called to do. Those two things. And I don't know if you know this or not, here and online, but Jesus talked about caring for the poor and the vulnerable nearly more than anything else in his teaching. Uh, specifically in Matthew 25, Jesus said these words. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did this for me. For me. You see, Jesus' kingdom is one of a radical reversal. It's a completely flipped. You know, instead of riding in on a stallion, what did our Savior come riding in on, right? A donkey. And instead of having servants, what did Jesus do? He bent and washed, right? He washed his disciples' feet. This is our Lord. He challenged us to think about everything that we do in life differently. It's one of radical reversals. He invites us to call and receive the most hurting around us as family. Did you catch that? That's what he calls us to do. And to reverse the false narrative that people who have less are less. And to affirm in their dignity and to restore the broken circumstances in our world. And I want to tell you about a seven-year-old girl who brought this into HD for my life. Uh, this is Winnie. Uh, this is a child that Francis and I began sponsoring just ahead of the U.S. run. And when this picture was taken, it's when I had the unique opportunity to meet Winnie. This was in August of 2012. And on this day, uh, we first met Winnie at her home, very humble home in the Rift Valley area of Kenya. And then we walked one mile to their water source. It's what you see pictured here. And as we got to the water source, we stood on the edge. And uh, Winnie's mom was with us. Her name is Justina. And I asked Justina as we stood there, I said, Justina, uh, where is it that you wash your clothes? They have very little. And she said, oh, right here. And then I said, and where do you all bathe? And she said, right here. And you can't see this, but around the perimeter of this little pond were livestock that were drinking and relieving themselves. And this is their water source. And then I took that five-gallon container. There's like a smile on my face in this picture. But I'm telling you, my heart was just ripping up on the inside. Because as I filled that container, I knew the source was contaminated. I just knew it. The water filling that five-gallon container would kill half the kids under the age of five in Winnie's Village. It's called the infant mortality rate. And my heart, like, broke. And then I carried that one mile back to Winnie's home. Uh, it weighs 50 pounds. So think of an old-school microwave on your shoulder full of water. And that one mile walk back to Winnie's home wrecked me, completely wrecked me. Uh, there was a, I call it a seismic shift that happened in my life that day, and I have not been the same since. Immediately, I began just thinking about Winnie and the thousands of kids like her that wouldn't have a shot for like life or fullness of life in many different ways. And then one of the cool things is then I learned how our $39 a month was being pooled together with the $39 of other people sponsoring children in Winnie's community. And how that would lift the entire community and not only bring clean water, but then sanitation and healthcare, uh, microfinance, education, these types of things, spiritual formation. And this next image, just one more picture I want to show you on the left side. This is when uh, before, uh, you know, before on the left is before when he had access to clean water and sanitation and these kinds of things. That was when, just before we began sponsoring her. Then on the right side is the last time that I saw Winnie just a couple of years ago. And what's really sweet is that their community now has clean drinking water. They have sanitation. 
Healthcare and education are merged into their community. Microfinance is even a part of their world. Uh, Justina, who's Winnie's mom, is a rock star. She is so amazing. She has started this thriving garden business. It is epic. And so many things. And get this, Winnie, every Sunday morning, Winnie, uh, she's a little teacher. I mean, she's a little teacher. And she teaches 20 to 25 smaller children truths from Scripture like you learn and hear here at First Assembly. And I'm telling you what, we have seen and hung out with Winnie uh, three times since first meeting her in August of 2012. And I'm telling you, this young, joy-filled, vibrant girl has not only become family, she has redefined family for us. It truly is broken circumstances restored. It is an inherent dignity affirmed. People in their whole communities are transformed. And in the few minutes that I have remaining, I want to tell you one story from the U.S. run. And then I want to invite you into something pretty powerful. So uh, this, uh, what occurred, happened about a week before I was due to finish in Battery Park. And I had just crossed into New Jersey and was, uh, again, within days of the U.S. run finishing. But on this day, something supernatural, almost unexplainable, occurred. First of all, I'd gotten a late start on my run that day. On my run schedule, that day was 35 miles. And I didn't start until 1 o'clock in the afternoon, which is very overwhelming to start that late in the day on a 35-mile run. And at mile 25, it was 6 o'clock. By this point, it was 6 o'clock in the evening. And there's a gray sky hovering over at mile 25. And I started up a fairly sharp incline. Now, I had just finished this uh, brutal week through the Allegheny Mountains, 175 miles with 32,000 feet of aggregate elevation change. The last thing that I wanted was another two-mile climb. And my first thought is, why is there a mountain here? Like, I'm in New Jersey. Like, isn't New Jersey supposed to be flat? I mean, I did not my ge geography well. Western New Jersey has mountains, but I didn't know this. And I was pretty ticked off that this was happening. And uh, I just found myself getting super, super irritated with every uphill step. Super, super irritated. The irritation soon turned to just flat out anger. Just unbridled anger. Anger at this stupid incline. Anger at this ridiculous run. Um, anger at God. Anger of how crappy I felt. I was just angry. And I'm not proud of this, but that quiet road, I uh, heard some choice four-letter words from a very, very fatigued soul. And directly after my fit of anger, a sense of aloneness swept over me. And I knew, I knew dozens, if not hundreds of people were holding me up in prayer. But I felt alone and isolated like never before. And uh, in the midst of this overwhelming feeling, I just put one uphill step in front of the other. Uh, a moment later, when my head was down, I kind of lifted it, and I noticed there was a cyclist coming down on my side of the road. Now, as the cyclist grew closer to me, he failed to come off the shoulder to give me room to run. This, <laughs> this added to my growing irritation. I'm thinking, buddy, uh, you better come off the shoulder. I will drop you into the ditch. Like, do not, do not play chicken with me right now. This pastor is in a really, really bad place. And uh, when he got about 20 yards from me, he did stop. And then he said, he just kind of stopped, and he said, are you Steve Spear? It was in disbelief, right? And I said kind of sheepishly, yes. And then he said, you're the guy running across the United States for clean water in Africa, right? In continued disbelief, I said yes. And then the next line out of his mouth floored me as if what he said previously didn't. He said, I just wanted to let you know, there's a group of about 10 people a mile up the road, and we're ready to cheer you on. We heard what you were doing, and he used these words. We want to remind you that you are not alone. We believe in you. Yes, amazing. <laughs> and I'm telling you, when those words came out of his mouth, I will never forget that moment for the rest of my life. I was in complete spiritual shock. I mean, I was stunned. I was overwhelmed. I was blown away. And then this angel of hope, he rode alongside me. I mean, previously I wanted to deck him, you know. But now he's my angel of hope. I'm just that fickle of a person, right? And sure enough, a mile up the road, here were 10 or 12 people clapping, cheering, and ready to rock my world. And... Um, this image is uh, likely meaningless to you, and that's okay. 
But um, these are my New Jersey angels. You see, these, this group of people saved something in me that day. And uh, they were followers of Christ, and we spent the next 10 or 15 minutes. We prayed, we hooped and hollered, we shared about our mutual faith in God, took some pictures. Um, uh, I still had 10 more miles to run on the day, so I didn't stay like a super long time. And as I ran into that next mile, I just marveled at the divine orchestration of the previous 45 minutes. Our God had met me in the midst of my broken spirit and my sense of aloneness. He knew this son of his was in trouble. And he miraculously tapped a group of unknown strangers to remind him with presence of hope and to remind him that he is not alone. So First Assembly family, here and for those of you that are online, I have a reminder for you and an invitation. Here's the reminder. You are not alone. You are not alone. I have no idea what you came into this space with. For those of you online, what might be swirling in your world? There could be something happening within your home, something at work, something at school, something within a relationship that is just has you feeling isolated. And I want to remind you today that you're not alone. You're not. Take that truth to heart. Maybe the only thing you needed to hear today. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is Psalm 125, verses 1 and 2, that simply say, as the Lord Whereas the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. You are not alone. The invitation that I want to invite you into is this. I want to invite you to come alongside a child. And not just any child, but a child specifically in the country of Zambia in a community called Mbeza. And I want to invite you, and we want to invite you to come alongside a child today and remind them, A, that they're not alone, but to reverse this false narrative that those who have less are less. And to become a part of their world to affirm their inerrant dignity and to restore their broken circumstances. And I'm so grateful that over the next stretch of time, beginning today, you're going to be learning more about this community called Mbeza in the country of Zambia. In beautiful country with beautiful people, with beautiful children who simply lack the basic resources to thrive. I mean, these children are so full of hope even though they have so little. And there's this pairing together of what God is doing here in a very unique way with what he's doing there and how he can knit that together. And get this, there are, there's over a thousand kids in Beza that are waiting to be sponsored. And we believe that God may be authoring a vision here at First Assembly for several hundred individuals or more to say, let's make this a part of who we are at First Assembly as well. And so I want to unapologetically today, we do invite you to become a child sponsor. To say yes to sponsoring one of the hundreds of kids in this community in Zambia. And how your $39 a month will be pooled together with $39 of others who sponsor in Mbeza to just as with Winnie, restore broken circumstances and affirm an inerrant dignity. And I know that whether you're here online, some of you sponsor children already. And for that, we want to say thank you. Thank you for doing that. But maybe God is opening your heart for one more or maybe two more. Or maybe you've never done this. That God is opening your heart for this. Because I'm telling you, there's something different and very groundbreaking about what we're doing. And let me tell you why. At World Vision, we've been partnering with churches for many, many years to do this amazing sponsorship, friendship, between a person here and a child in the developing world. And typically how we would have you do this is you would walk out into your lobby right outside the hub area, right outside this section over here, and there you would see, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of child picture folders, right, hanging from some clothesline with some clothespins, uh, dozens of pictures of children for you to choose from. But for the last year or so, we've been praying some big prayers at World Vision. Prayers that would continue to push us in new ways to better serve his vulnerable children. And a few months ago, he birthed an idea in us that radically reversed our world. You see, he led us to ask the question, what would it look like for the first time ever if this whole thing were reversed? And instead of us choosing a child, they were empowered to choose us.
So whatever you have done for the least of these, you have done it unto me. What's going to happen is this coming Wednesday, get this, this coming Wednesday, there's going to be a choosing party in Mimbeza, Zambia. And guess who's throwing the party? You are. <laughs> First Assembly is throwing a choosing party in Zambia. And you know who the guests of honor are going to be? The children of Mimbeza are going to walk into some settings, walk into a school, walk into churches. And guess whose pictures they're going to see? You're going to see your pictures. Your pictures are going to be hanging on some clothesline with some clothespin. And they're going to, with like hope in their heart, smiles on their faces, they're going to choose you. And then they're going to write you a letter. And you're going to receive that. And they're going to tell you why they chose you. And I'm telling you, it is transformational and powerful what happens with this. You see, because the choice goes into the child's hand. In the developing world, poverty really does happen because of the lack of choice. And at the very beginning of the relationship, we're putting that power into the child's hand to choose you, to choose us. And it's so, so amazing. Now, prior to the pandemic, our plan was to have Pastor Rob and Pastor Sarah jump on a plane tonight and take your pictures to Zambia. Obviously, travel's a little challenged right now. But with the, these children deserve the party of their lives sooner than later, just with all that's happening in the world. So we're going to take Pastor Rob and Sarah to Zambia. We're just waiting for all schedules to clear and get all those clearances to make that kind of travel. But we want this choosing party to happen and to go on in a very, very powerful way. As a matter of fact, this last Tuesday, we jumped on a Zoom call with some of our colleagues from Zambia. And I think we had a picture here of a few of us on a Zoom call. There's Sarah. Uh, well, no, that's Heather. We didn't, we didn't get, well, you took the picture, Sarah, and we didn't even get you on that. But anyways, uh, Sarah was definitely on there. But just an amazing time to connect with the field, find out some of the needs. A couple other cool things that we're going to be doing. Uh, uh, you're going to take the most epic picture of your life. We'll tell you about that in just a moment. But once you say yes to being chosen, that picture is going to be merged into a private First Assembly Chosen Facebook group. I think we've got an image of that popping up here right now. And as you say yes, you're going to be able to see and celebrate a bunch of the other people from uh, the First Assembly family that have said yes to being chosen from the first service. For those of you online, we've got this all figured out for you. But you get to see and celebrate all that God is doing from the people. You can high five one another, all these kinds of things. And one of the pictures that I'm the most looking forward to is this one that's popping up here of Pastor Rob uh, and their family. Because this image of Pastor Rob and their family is going to be hanging uh, on some string uh, in Mbeza, Zambia to be chosen. And one of the things I've looked forward to all week is just hearing your pastor's heart around this and why now. So, um, yeah, Pastor Rob, come and share with us more. Thank you, Steve. You appreciate Steve's testimony and what he's sharing today? I remember when Rhonda and I were dating and talking about getting married, you know, I'd, I'd pop the question, she said yes, and we're talking about, you know, how many kids will we, will we have and what home will we live in and uh, what kind of cars will we drive, you know, those types of things. We, we set out and we were like, we want five kids, you know, five. That would, be, that, would just be, that would just be awesome. And then we had three, and I was like, I think I'm done, okay? <laughs> I, think, I think I'm done having kids. And then Sophia was the bonus kid, and we were like, oh, we're pregnant, awesome. So we had, we had four, but uh, God, you know this, if you've been in the family very long, that God, he has his way of working things out in your life because he has a plan like we've talked about. It's already written down. He's... And we get to follow that plan. So I have four biological kids, but about 18 years ago, when we were youth pastors at a church in Indianapolis, a boy named Will came to our youth group. He came with a friend. He lived right next door to the church in, an, in the apartment complex. And Will came in and we met Will. And um, Will quickly liked the youth ministry and he liked our church and he liked our family. And Will began to show up 
every day after school, okay? So a 12-year-old is showing up every day, and as a good youth pastor, I put the kid to work, okay? It's like, if you're going to be here, you're going to be about the work. If you're going to be in the church, let, you know, let's go. So Will would uh, show up, and we would, we would clean things. We would set up things. He would show up three hours early for youth group on Wednesday nights and taught him how to, you know, hey, let's set up chairs. Let's get everything ready. Here's, here's how you run the computer for the PowerPoint. Here's how you do the lights and the sound, which he really loved. And he kept choosing to come back and to come back again and again. And Will really captured our, our hearts, the hearts of everybody in our family. And he began to come over on the weekends and, and kind of hang out and go out to eat with us and things. And Will was pushing into 16 years old. And so I remember talking to Will and saying, hey, man, you're going to be 16 soon. You know, what about a driver's license and a job? And, and he let me know that because of his circumstances, that that was not a possibility. So we began to look into those circumstances, and as Rhonda and I were talking, we, we, we were like, what if, you know, this, this guy who's chosen us and, and who we love and he loves us, what if we looked into adopting Will? And so we went to a lawyer, looked into the adoption, but because of some extenuating circumstances, some laws that are, that are in Indiana, it was not possible for us to adopt Will to come and live with us, but it didn't keep us from embracing Will and him continuing to embrace us. Will joins us in, uh, we still have a relationship, we moved to Fort Wayne, and uh, Will was like, just because you're moving away, I'm not going to let you get away, so he shortly moved to Fort Wayne after we moved here, and he's still a part of our family. He's in the Mother's Day picture that you saw that Steve showed, uh, he comes to holidays with us, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, he's just a part of um, our family, and we're, we're, so, we're so thrilled to have this fifth child in our, in our family, because you know what? This kid that showed up at our youth group at 12 years old has, has really um, impacted our lives, and we've impacted his to the point that he calls us mom and dad. The beauty of our story is that um, from the beginning, Will sought us out, and our lives, you know, they, they've, they've not been the same, and this week, you will get to know the thrill of being chosen by someone that will change your life forever. You know, Wednesday, as these children have their choosing party in Zambia, they're going to have the opportunity to see your pictures and my picture and to choose one of us. And I believe because this is just how God works, that he is going to direct their eyes, their heart, and their hands to choose the one that he has picked out for them and you're going to get connected to the kid that God has picked out for you. I want to show a video, a story of, of Yinka and the power of being chosen. Great. Sounds sweet. So all you have to do is just tell me all your secrets, <laughs> social security number. I'm going to start sweating. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just in November, I had surgery unexpectedly. Thankfully, you know, all went well. I'm recuperating from that. But I just feel that that really has shown that there are so many things bigger than us. I'm grateful that even in this season, I haven't lost hope. God is showing up in big ways and small ways um, to remind me that I am loved and that I matter. Many people have invested in me. And if I can do a small part to share that with other people, for it. I actually just want to show you a little bit of okay. what we did last week. So just have a look at this. Sounds good. Hello Inka, kwa majina naitwa Mary Nzoki, niko na miaka 9. Nikiwa shuleni napenda kusoma English. How are you? We are fine. Nikikuwa mkubwa napenda kuwa lawyer. Sana kuimba nyimbo za Sunday school. Hivi si na sasa Sunday tena tano mwinge. Nondo wa kwede wa tena Yesu ngoni. Inka na kuchagua wewe. Wow. <laughs> She's beautiful. She wants to be a lawyer? 
Why is it amazing that she wants to be a lawyer? What's the connection? I'm a lawyer. <laughs> what does it feel like to be chosen? It feels wonderful and it feels like a God thing. We are so connected in, in the sense that through God we're intertwined and we all have a, an opportunity to love on one another and to support one another. I even feel like it's giving me big shoes to fill in terms of, you know, being a great example for her, knowing that she saw something in me and, you know, want, wants to partner together in life. So she's giving me a lot. God is an, int God is an intentional God. She wants to be a lawyer and look who she got connected to, someone who already is. You know, that's, that is the God we serve and I'm excited about our opportunity to connect and to see as we lean into this, the children that are gonna choose us. You know, you may ask, well, why Zambia? And honestly, when the list came to Pastor Sarah and I and we began to look at all the countries that were available, we, we chose Zambia. I can't give you a reason why. I wish I could say the Holy Spirit told us Zambia, you know, even ahead of time, but that was the country that we chose. And one day after we had signed the papers and sent it to World Vision and we were committed to Zambia, I happened to hear about countries having country codes, like if you're going to call that country. So I was like, oh, I wonder what Zambia's country code is. So I Googled it real quick. Folks, the country code to call Zambia is 260. <laughs> now that's, yeah, I know. That's just crazy. For, for those of us, those of you maybe watching online, you're like, what does that mean? Our area code here in Fort Wayne is 260. So I'm excited that even though we maybe don't always see it, God is already orchestrating something. And I hope that this 260 can reach into that 260 and that 260 can reach back into us. And I would love, I just, to, to, to continue the 260 thought, I'd love to see a sponsor, 260 kids. Would love to see that happen. Big goal, big number, but I think God is definitely in this. It's our vision to uh, embrace God's vision. Next week, I can't wait to see the celebration for those of us who sign up today to see uh, the envelope, to open the envelope, to get to see who has chosen us and just to get to share in that time together next week. Steve's gonna come on back and he's gonna give us some final instructions and our next steps. When, uh, when Pastor Rob shared the 260 thing, I was like completely messed up. That was like crazy. And that the God is authoring that, again, not coincidental. So you're probably saying, okay, what do we do? To do Two quick steps about how you jump in and become a part of this. First thing you want to do is just pull out your phone. Just pull out your phone and you, first thing that you do is you start with a text message. And uh, we're throwing something on the screen that you can see here in the room and online. Uh, open up a text message. Just start a new one. And you would put in the body of the message, if you're here in person, you're going to put FAFW, First Assembly Fort Wayne, if you're here in person. If you're online, FAFW online, okay? So you put that in the, where you would normally put, wow, Steve and Pastor Rob do look alike. No, don't put that. Put in either FAFW or FAFW online, right? And then once you do that, then you're going to put uh, in the two, you're going to put it to 56170. I'm typing that in right now. And then, uh, then hit send. I see some of you doing this. And then just hit send. And then what happens is in about an eight or ten seconds, you're going to get back a, a buzz back link. And your mind just hit. So w open that link. And then you just begin filling out some information. Uh, obviously, you fill out your name, uh, you know, uh, credit card or checking account information for the $39 a month. You begin filling that out. Um, that, that's further down in the process. One of the first questions you get ans uh, asked is, how many children would you like to be chosen by? Uh, if it happens to be more than one, that's amazing. Uh, what will happen is just your picture will be printed off that many times and then hung uh, in Zambia for children to choose you this coming Wednesday. So that's kind of step one. Just kind of do that. Begin filling out that information. You can begin that now. Step two is when it gets super exciting. Because step two is you're going to walk out into the lobby. And again, if you're online, you do all of this online. Just as I'm describing, go ahead and text FAFW online. Fill out the information. Step two is if you're in person, you're going to go out to the lobby and you're going to take the most epic picture of your life. And if you're online, you're going to upload the most epic picture of your life. Why is it epic? Because as we've said, this is going to hang in Zambia. A child will choose you. And then next Sunday, when you return for Reveal Sunday, you're going to get an envelope. You're going to come in. There'll be a bunch of chosen envelopes, and your name will be on one of them. 
and then you'll open it, and it will be the picture of the child holding your picture. And it's just an amazing thing. For those of you that are online, you're going to get a digital reveal. So you'll see all of this as well. So we've got you covered. So a um, couple of reminders. Here's what you need to do as reminders. One, as you go out to the lobby or you're online, if you have any trouble whatsoever with technology, we have people that can help you. In the lobby, we have folks with iPads. If your phone's not working, if you don't have your phone, if you don't have a phone, we've got you covered. We have folks online that can assist you as well. That's kind of reminder number one. Uh, number two, you have to have all of this wrapped up by 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, this gives us a chance to get all the pictures done ahead of the choosing party uh, on, on Wednesday. And then the final thing, like I would mentioned, do not want to miss um, next week with Reveal Sunday. It's going to be a really amazing time to celebrate God's transformation and this good work that he's continuing to do in us. And in this pursuit of the 260 vision is pretty amazing. So we're so grateful. Can't wait to meet you um, out in the lobby. And I'll turn it back over to Pastor Rob. Church, this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to lift people through the power of the cross, again, through another global impact opportunity. And I hope that you embrace this. It's, it is our mission to reach people here, near, and far. Our, tick, our 260 reaching their 260, it's, it's what we're about and it's what, it's what we're doing. You know, some of, some of you may know some of our story. I think my wife has shared in different contexts and groups that um, even though we have uh, four biological kids and, and Will, um, we've had six miscarriages in, you know, in the course of, of, of having our kids, some of them as late as week 13 and 14. And so in sharing those things with our kids as, as they've grown up, you know, just they've had, they've had questions. They're like, did you name them? Did you, um, um, so uh, will we see them in heaven? Uh, so do I have other brothers and sisters? Are there more Hazlitts? You know, and I'm like, man, some of the, those are just questions that I just don't have all the answers for. As, um, as Rhonda and I were talking about sponsorship, I proposed to her, what if we sponsored one kid for each of our miscarriages? And that would give us a name and a picture for six kids. Otherwise, we never would have met. They're not to replace the six miscarriages, but uh, just what about that connection? And Rhonda was like, babe, whatever you want to do, let's do it. That sounds fantastic. So we are going to sponsor six kids and those pictures will be somewhere in our home, probably right next to the other pictures that we have of the rest of our family. But I just, want, just wanted you to know that, that we're in this. We're, we're about this today and we're going to jump in with both feet. And if God would put it on your heart to sponsor one or two or, or, or several others, you know, lean into that. And if you'll do that today before you leave, that would be most appropriate. If you stand with me, I want to say a closing prayer for us today. Lord, we love you. We are thrilled to be a missions embracing church. And Lord, the conditions of the community in Zambia, they, they are not acceptable. And Lord, there's a group of people, there's people of God right here in this church in Fort Wayne who can move and respond and be a part of something that is so much bigger than us. Lord, I believe that there's Hoosiers who are going to invade Zambia. And I believe that children are going to respond and they're going to choose us. This, this 260 is going into their 260. Thank you, Jesus, that we get to be the hands and feet and help these children know that they are chosen by God, that we see them and that they have a significance in this world. We love you. And God, everything we do is to bring glory to your name and to lift you up because we want to see your kingdom advanced. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Love you, church. It's wonderful being with you this morning. If you would, hit the booth on your way out. If you need us, we're here for prayer. If not, we will see you next week at the celebration. Come